All right, let's, ha let's have our presenters for the last uh, few verses get going. Ten, four, one, nine, one, two, one, two, 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 ten, one, two, one, two, ten, one, two, one, two, eight, five, nine, one, two, ten, nine, one, two, five. Problems with numbers? Okay, you've got taste sarcas. Hey, epithumia, taste sarcas in line one. You've got taste as a two, and we think you know better than that. Any other that you didn't like? And if you wanted to do a squiggly after pan ta for all ta en to caso, again, that's a prepositional phrase that's used as a noun. Yes? Since you have the apposition, could you also do the same thing for the entire the less of the flesh and the less of the eyes? And do a squiggly and I'll make the entire thing a two as well? Uh, I mean, it wouldn't be wrong. To show that they're in apposition, just you know, how far do you want to stretch your your word processor capabilities, or how much paper do you want to use? But yeah, you're you're right. Those those things do all fulfill a, a, a parallel function. Cross reference. Cross reference analysis. Galatians 5:16. I say then, walk in the spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Against First Peter 4 2, that he no longer shall live at the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Here we see the contrast between our subject, verse 16, and uh, these two verses. Obviously, talking about um, walking as children of God versus walking as children of the flesh and under a different owner. Commentary interaction. Looking at Scott, at Stott, since everything in the world comes from the world, we may not love any of it. John selects three for special. John Stott, or three, uh, sorry, John, the author, hopefully, has selects three for special mention. The crave is a sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does. These appear to him the essential marks of the pagan way of life. This life is the life that is present in concrete manifestation, according to how he quotes uh, Westcott in the stock page 103 and 4. It appears in verse 17 as well, where it is translated material possessions. As Lou restricts the three to a threefold formula as mentioned in verses 12 to 14 previously, that distinguishes them to stemming from but one desire in her page 95. Both writers correctly state that if they do not belong to the Father but the world, they should be avoided at all costs. Final translation. Because all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes and the arrogance of life to run in the dark, but this of the world. I started off there, or I finished up there with a small B and because, as it carries on from verse, or it can be said to be carrying on from the previous verse. There's a case both ways. Grounded insight, Finley summarizes the three categories as two forms for deprivation arising from our needs and one from our possessions. <coughs> Unholy is that, excuse me, is that deprivation, do you mean, is that a form of depriving? Yes. So it should be D-E-P-R-I, right? Yeah, fair enough. Because otherwise, that looks like a form of depravity? Yeah. Okay. 
deprivation arising from our needs and one from our possessions. Unholy desire for things one has not, and unholy pride in things one has. Stop page 104. This compares with that of God. Quote, base desires, false values, and egotism. Unquote. The latter comes naturally from those who are in the Satan controlled kingdom of darkness, and this distinctly contrasts with those who have been reborn of God and know Him, as in John 17, 14, and verse 16, who have been chosen out of the world and do not belong to it. Therefore, these ones should not practice what characterizes those who remain known to God. Okay, any comment? Or correction? A lot of directions to go in the translations. And most, you know, the more ambitious the commentary is, the more discussion there'll be of different routes you can take in trying to convey this. And of course, uh, overarching it all is the Johannine insight, uh, God so loved the world. And here we're told to love not the world. So we're back in attention. And uh, this, this has to be explained and unpacked. Verse 17, uh, the numbers I have are 10, 1, 2, 5, 10, 1, 2, 3, 1, 10, 6, 1, 2, 1, 2, 5, 9, 1, 2. Any number problems? Looks pretty good. Um, the cross references are there. Uh, after Matthew 7:21 was one of those exclamation points, the mother loved. So those are the further references listed at uh, those points. Observations: Would the believers live in a period of transition? While they still live in their flesh, they seek, not, they seek to not live for the desires of men, but for the will of God. Uh, the form of the world and its desires are in the process of fading away, but have not yet fully been eliminated. Uh, yet believers are called to live for a new master and yield themselves to heavenly desires, the will of their God who will establish them forever. There's some grammatical considerations. Stott differentiates between uh, the world used in Johannian literature and the rest of the New Testament. Uh, he believes that it's always used by John to describe fallen humanity. Um, and then uh, Leo points out the use of a singular desire here and believes it shows to be uh, more than number of inappropriate human longings, namely the negative aspiration and mindset that the author has identified as alien to God. So uh, before in the, the previous verse, uh, Leo didn't want to take each individual um, thread there, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the arrogance of life, but move them all together in one desire. He just continues on. Um, the emphasis of the verse, uh, he recognizes the dualism of the world against the Father in this passage, but states that it's not a fixed, unchanging opposition. She says, earlier in this chapter in 2a, John described the darkness as on the way out. Uh, now he uses the same verb of the world and its desire. Um, she believes John expresses the utter incompatibility between the sphere that represents God's will and intention and all that opposes it, as well as the complete certainty that regardless of whatever might be happening in society and to this community of believers, the opposition to God was irreversibly doomed. So I actually had a hard time wrapping my head around what she was trying to emphasize there, um, whether or not she was trying to emphasize that uh, it was a strong um, opposition or whether it was a slow transition. But I think that eventually she kind of focuses on um, the contrast is not really between the present and the future, but between the transients and permanence, between the already disappearing world and the immovability of the one who does the will of God. And uh, Stott um, agreed with that, that 
Uh, we, will, we, will, we shall more readily obey the command to not love the world if we remember that while the world and its desires are transient, God's will and those who do it alike are alike eternal. So the, the final translation uh, would be, and the world is passing away and its desire, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. And uh, a grounded insight would be a tremendous motivation for believers to remain faithful is the truth that those who live by their own desire will not last, but those who live from God's will shall remain forever. And uh, the gravity of the world and its desires cannot be escaped. The eternal hope for those who do the will of God cannot be questioned. The temporary is contrasted against the eternal. And in light of the previous verse depicting the powerful pull of the flesh, um, from both within and without, verse 17 is an even stronger motivation for seeking God's will rather than one's own desire. Those who do God's will shall last, unlike the world and its desires. Okay, any comment or question? It's a lot of self evident truth here, and a lot of imponderable um, questions. I mean, things we all have to work out. What, what's the world and what's, what's love for it? And uh, we always have to remember something the commentaries you know, tend to say at the beginning and then kind of forget. Uh, John is dealing with people apparently who know who he is and he knows who they are. And they probably had ways of, of deciphering and applying the things he was saying without immediately going to bizarre ex excesses like, like we could because we, you know, we don't have the same controls uh, through knowing him and having you know, maybe been in his presence so on, so on and so forth. But I think this is where doctrines of unity of scripture often can help us because, for example, uh, Jesus w was emphatic that there's a world order that, that he came to destabilize and eventually to redeem, as well as to judge. But he came bringing the kingdom. He came announcing the kingdom. And it's not like, you know, there was no reign of God here before, but certainly in his coming, you know, on the same streets and with the same horizons that people who love the world live, we are subjects of God's kingdom and this is his world. And we relate to the things that we see in the world differently than a person who doesn't know God. In other words, this world is transformed. It's sanctified, as, as Paul says. All things are sanctified through prayer and the word. They're sanctified because we're subjects of the king who rules over a kingdom. And his kingdom extends to this world. So we can have a positive regard for things in the world without loving the things in the world. Because again, it's sanctified because it's going through a relationship with God. I mean, I think you could convict Jesus of loving things in the world, like, say, people. <laughs> so, you know, you, could, you can easily push this in directions I, I don't think John intended for it to say. And one way to, we can't ask John, you know, point blank, but I think we can go to the places in Scripture and bring some, bring some perspective and contour you know, into this, lest we either become extremist or say, well, this is, so, this is such hyper, hyperbolic overstatement that it, you, you really can't take it seriously. Micah? Yeah, do you agree with the blanket statement that uh, the use of world in all of John's writings is, is the same uh, designation? I don't think I found that to be true when I studied it. Yes? Uh, in this verse, the the verb uh, paragatai is singular, and uh, because of that, would you think that the hey epithemia out too is emphatic? That the world is passing away and it's less. Instead of using a plural verb, use a singular. Well, as you you may know in Greek, they tended, like a lot of modern languages, and unlike English, English is is pretty religious. If you have a compound subject, you have to have a compound verb. But most languages that have a compound subject, 
they uh, conform the verb to the nearest subject. So if you've got three subjects in German and they're all singular, it's still going to be a singular verb, more than likely. And a lot of other languages are like that too. But certainly Greek, wouldn't, you wouldn't expect a, a, a plural verb here just because there's two subjects, because they're both singular subjects. This would be optional for the writer. Thank you. Next verse. What's cool about these verses is they give us something to do. They give us something to think about. And we may not know exactly how to take it, but what we can't say is, well, this doesn't apply to us. <laughs> I can't think of anywhere in the world where the world intrudes on you more than Southern California. We and we love it. Yes, who said that? <laughs> Second last word on line one, Kai. How do you translate that in the end? <coughs> You're a little too high for us. And you don't translate it. So if you really want to stick to it not being translated, then you would call it 11. And, and you'd say, well, it's a particle that we just throw away. But then you'd have to do a comprehensive search of all the chi's, which would be several thousand, and see if you can document uh, a chi that's a particle. And I wouldn't recommend that. So it might be more feasible to call it an eight and think of it in terms of even now. Anyway, you, I don't think you want a 10 there because you don't translate and. Yeah. We'll stay on this page. Did anybody see a number you didn't like? You want to go back to the numbers? Lawrence is a glutton for punishment. He's giving us every chance right now. He's turning the other cheek. Yes? Uh, Hoffian. Is that, could that be a conjunction as well? With another 18? Yes. Um, and, you know, the, the eightness comes in, it answers a how question. It's how we know. You know, whence we know, from this we know. So it, there's a howness. I would call it an 8-10. It's an adverbial conjunction. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm most happy with 8-10. I'm sort of happy with 10. I'm least happy with 8, but I give you credit for any of those three. You get, that's the right idea. OK, um, cross-references. A little more. I've noted two cross references there. First Corinthians 10, 11. Didn't put the text in there because I wanted us to focus on Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, possible even the elect. He's talking here of those false prophets with false teaching and related to the verse, subject of verse 18. There are many come already, and verse 24 and Matthew 24 predicts that they will come. Grammar and direction. 
the word antichristos only appears in the Johannine letters, verse 18, verse 22, and chapter 4, verse 4, and 6, verse 7. This was generally thought of as a sign of the approaching end of the age, of stop page 107. Previous, his previous commentary indicated that Christians already knew that they were living in the last days, quote unquote, and that the true light was shining with the world and its darkness fading away. Begs the question, what is the meaning of the many antichrists coming? <coughs> and Scott maintains that many antichrists, which are best interpreted as substitute Christs, are merely forerunners of the main spoke, are the main ones spoken in the second Thessalonians uh, two, still to come. <coughs> brings us final translation. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you have already heard, Antichrist is coming. Many Antichrists have come already. Therefore, we know from this that it is the last hour. Where did you get your first already? Just as you have already heard. Already heard. Uh, that was my insertion, effectively. Because they've already heard it. They had it before, and so I thought it'd be nice for a sweet translation for a bit. Okay. Grounded insight. The Antichrist here is clearly one who is against Christ, not just one who apes Christ. Verse 22 refers to such a one whose teaching is fundamentally counterfeit to and opposing Christ. Stop page 108. Whilst the ultimate Antichrist corresponds to Paul's man of lawlessness, as in Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, the many here refer to those who came with a teaching that was against that of Christ. Though Christians should watch out for it and avoid such teaching. Okay. Thank you. You'll notice in Essay Alant that there's a, sort of a double break there. There's a new paragraph and there's a wide gap on the page, and also the Byzantines put a three. So this is, by, you know, everybody agrees this begins a new literary division in the book. For verse 19, the numbers are 9, 3, 5, 10, 8, 5, 9, 3, 10, 10, 9, 3, 5, 5, 11, 9, 3, 10, 10, 5, 10, 8, 5, 4, 9, 3. Hang on just a minute. Okay, we'll go. We'll go with that for now. Go ahead. So the uh, cross references that we listed were Acts twenty thirty and First Corinthians eleven nineteen. Observation would be believers know that evil men will arise not only from outside the church but from within. There will likely arise divisions and factions within the church, and the believers must hold fast to the truth and proper obedience to show themselves. Within the grammars, the, the commentaries, uh, both Stott and Leo recognize that uh, that this verse was indicating purpose. Stott argues that John not only relates the fact of their departure, but discerns the purpose in it. That is demonstrating that they were not of us. And uh, Leo agrees, in page 101. Uh, they believe, and primarily Stott here um, says that this verse uh, provides a test to the church that. If the false teachers had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. This is stated as a principle. Those who belong to us stay with us. Future and final perseverance is the ultimate test of past participation in Christ. And he believes that this verse also gives biblical warrant for some distinction between the visible and invisible church. For all members uh, of the church participating in church activities are not necessarily members of Christ, as they may be with us, but not of us. Uh, he says they share our earthly company, but not our heavenly birth. 
Uh, Liu believes that what John says about origins in the previous verse seems somewhat contradictory um, because of uh, the origin being they were from us, but we're realizing that they were not really of us. But she believes that John solved this potential problem by again focusing on the temporary uh, verse or against the permanent. Those who seem to be originating from of us could not truly be of God, but they would remain. Their heavenly origin must have been illusory. This, this is an academic problem, but it's it's something you encounter so much uh, pastorally, and also um, just the longer you live, the more you see people fall away. I mean, just statistically. Um, so I used to be a lot more bothered by this. How can it happen? But I've just seen it happen so many times. Uh, I still don't understand it a lot of times, but. Um, it's a, it's a tribute, I think, primarily to the uh, the the ability of the human heart to deceive itself. And of course, people who fall away, you're always hopeful they'll come back. But um, people people are in religion, which is to say, in our sphere, they're in churches for lots of different reasons by many different avenues. And uh, you can counterfeit. I mean, people look perfectly fine. And you, just don't, you don't know their lives. You don't know their hearts. You don't know what goes on when you're not around. And then later on, you realize, yeah, they, they fell away. They left the ministry. They committed this crime. But you, 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 start, to, you start to see the paper trail. Or, you know, it, it, generally, it, it, it makes sense, even at the human level. So happens. So a suggested uh, final translation would be, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they were of us, they would have been with us. But they went out so that they might re be revealed for all are not of us. A grounded insight would be, be sober, not surprised. Be sober, but not surprised. Examples bound of men and women who have been in the faith. These examples serve as a warning of the deception of the world. This will continue and should keep the Christian sober, but not surprised. Men will deceive, and will be self-deceived, and John warns his readers to remain faithful and confirm their heavenly origin. You, you might um, think about if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. That that might capture the semantic sense a little bit better than if they were of us. I'm not saying you necessarily should change it, but if anybody had, if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. I think that, that captures the conditionality of, of John's language. Uh, why don't you do the last verse too, since you're up there. Rich? I had a question about um, cross-referencing this with Revelation about the Nicolaitans and Revelation 2 and 3. Um, does, one help, what, does this verse help to interpret that passage in Revelation? <laughs> it, and and what, what is exactly the link that you see? That the Nicolaitans had uh, uh, Christian origin, or that they were presenting some alternative Christianity that John is the right revelation to tell the radical. It certainly is an apparent analogy. And of course, there's also a, a possible parallel in someone like Judas. You know, I mean, Jesus washed his feet, and he had all the disciples fooled. But finally, he was unmasked. So if it could happen, you know, and Jesus prayed all night before he chose him. Maybe that's one reason he stayed all, up all night praying. God, are you sure? <laughs> this, you, am I supposed to choose this person? 
because because you know so often Jesus had insight into people's hearts. It's hard to imagine that you know he went for a couple of years and didn't realize Judas was a traitor. Maybe he did. I don't know. But sometime before the last night, he knew. So uh, this is it's a great tragedy and mystery, and it's another it's another justification for faithfulness in ministry because. Um, you know, we we don't want to take people's. We don't want to take them for granted. Go ahead. So, for verse twenty, the numbers I have are ten, three, two, five, nine, one, two. Ten, five, four. I think technically your hagiu would be 4-2 because hagias is an adjective, but it's a substantive here. And the same with uh, panta. By all there, you, you mean all things, right? It's, it's not a, it's not an adjective just hanging out all you know all and then he goes to the next sentence you know all things right well that's not how I translated it in my commentary I just indicated that because that's the word that we know when I actually translated it I took it as you all know okay let's go let's go back up to the Greek Uh, panta there is what case? Uh, the junior. Excuse me? The junior? For the case accusative? Yes, accusative. So can it be the subject? Um, no. You can't say you all know. Would it be the, the same or is, could it be taken in a way? No. Because it would be pantes <laughs> with an Epsilon sigma if it's nominative. So that has to be, and you know Panta all things. However, you're taking the Tregellis text there, I think, right? Uh, I believe so. I, well, I was reading the commentaries, and then also I believe ESV goes with uh, you all know. Yes, but that's because the ESV is translating the Nessie Allant. And the Nestle Allant part has Pontes. That's the nominative. So there's a variant here. And my guess is you took that off what I sent, which is Tregellus. Right, I was going off the other text. Right, and that's the Textus Receptus, or closer to the Textus Receptus. So if you read Pontes, then it's the, the, the U implied in the Te is bound up with that nominative Pontes. You all, all of you. Oida tet, no. But if it's pan tas, then that's accusative, and it's you know all things. That's why the King James says you know all things. Um, give us your final translation, because we have to turn everybody loose. Final transition was for you have the anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. And that is pretty good. Pick one of your grounded insights. So the the top one is the grounded insight. Well, Beware claims to the special to special truth that elevate the knowledge of man rather than the words of Scripture used to work on the heart by the Spirit. You know, if you follow my commentary, it's a lot easier to, uh, to uh, support that because I argue that the anointing really is the message, the word, the gospel. Most commentators take that to be the Holy Spirit. So if you take it to be the Holy Spirit, then it's harder to um, stand behind what you just said. So Stott believes that it's the Holy Spirit and he believes that it's the word and the gospel. Yep. In this case, I think Lou's right. Uh, thank you. Let's give a hand to Lawrence.
joshua.